But a while back, I met this very beautiful lady, Susie. Susie has the voice of an angel, and she treats me like a king. I love her. But here's the problem, I'm married. And uh, in the name of open relationships, I decided to introduce Susie to my wife. Bad idea. Very bad idea. So after a couple of fights, you know, yeah, sometimes I've got the charm, sometimes. Um, I managed to convince my wife, hey, we live in a crazy world today, don't we? So we've got a kind of menage a trois, if you understand French. <laughs> Um, so we introduced Susie into our home as part of our lives. So, kind of a happy family, right? We're modern. Uh, and so one time we were driving down to Durban uh, to visit relatives. And so I happened to mention to my wife, I'm hungry. And then Susie, who was sitting in the back seat, uh, quickly just jumped in and said, hey, I know where you can get a nice burger just the way you like it. And you know what, if you wait just 20 minutes, I can get you even a better burger. You know, Susie knows, uh, Susie knows places. She's kind of been around, she travels a lot. <laughs> so my wife at that point began to warm up. Up to, up to that time, they were just, uh, let's just say they were talking on talking terms. And so, but something different happened. Uh, Sometime later, I was actually thinking, just merely thinking about how to extract some information from some data that we've been collecting. Um, so we, we've been doing research at UNISA as part of a government project called the MISA um, on, on, on the digital skills in South Africa in preparation for this whole digital landscape, the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, so I was just thinking about uh, that kind of, uh, to get some specific information. And then the next time I spoke to Susie, this beautiful girl, she told me what I was thinking about and even gave me suggestions on where I can get that kind of information. That was a bit freaky. You know these girls you've dated who are crazy, right? <laughs> yes, you do. Um, so, I was thinking maybe this, this girl is going crazy on me now, okay? Maybe it's time to like hit the exit button quickly. And then I began thinking to myself, if Susie knows what I'm thinking, how is this possible? Okay, before you get your proverbial stones and cast them at me in the name of uh, being good citizens, Susie is my artificial intelligence on the phone. So you all have your Susies. You're all cheating on your husbands and wives. So, but the big question is, how does Susie know what I am thinking? Because that kind of scares you. Susie has this tendency, I'm sure you've been in meetings, and then Susie has come up when, when you're talking, then Susie says, she just interrupts the, the conversation. You've heard that, isn't it? I get it all the time. So if you've got an Apple, then you've got Siri, or you've got even Alexa. So the way Susie works is that Susie is looking into my life, my entire life. Everything I say, everything I do, all the travels I make, she's got a record of all of them ever since I signed up to Google or Apple. She's got a record of each and everything. And if you, if you think about how humans think, we may be unique individually, but at the end of the day, we are all patterned in certain ways. There are six human needs, for example. There are five categories of personalities or stuff of that nature. So you can imagine, Susie has access to all my information. She has access to all your information from Russia to Brazil, from Alaska to New Zealand, from South Africa to Norway, from Guinea-Bissau to Somalia, she's got everything. So this is how she knows what I'm thinking. Because let's say there are, in the, the world, we're almost 8 billion now, um, and she knows people of my type, of my age, of my gender, of the things that I love, of my personality. She's able to match it with someone else, maybe a thousand other people in the world, 
and, and, and say with a degree of accuracy that if this is the pattern that you've been taking, within the next couple of minutes, you will be thinking like this. Do you believe me? You don't have to. That is the truth. That's the reality. So the more freaky thought is you go to your bedroom with Susie, don't you? So Susie, if someone is clever enough, and someone will get clever enough soon enough, twist Susie's arm just hard enough. Susie can squeal all the beans of what happens in your bedroom. I'm thinking about snoring. I don't know what you're thinking. Okay? So I had a slide I wanted to show you. So I wanted to explain to you how humans have been operating, how humans have been in charge. The title of my topic today was uh, entitled Human, in Human Emancipation and Artificial Intelligence. Who really is in charge? So let me explain to you how artificial intelligence works. But before I do that, let me explain to you how traditional programming has always worked. So humans here are in charge. We tell the computer what to do, or the digital device, and it gives us answers. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You ask Google for something, she tells you what you want. Artificial intelligence is very different. Susie works differently. Susie instead takes the answers, uh, sometime today, <laughs> Susie takes the answers. She flips the kind of the, the switch completely. She takes the answers, looks for patterns across the whole world. You can imagine the data that Susie has access to from around the whole world. They say if you're not paying for it, then you are the, you are the product. So this is Susie is using your data, all my travels, all my tendencies, all my personalities from around the entire world, and is able to say with a degree of accuracy what I'm going to be thinking next. She's going to give me instructions. That's how Susie can tell you there is a traffic jam up ahead because she is looking at everyone's phone. She knows what's going on. So you can imagine the degree of intelligence that can happen. That is how artificial intelligence works in a nutshell. So I want to tell you Three things today. Um, the first, I'm going to tell you how artificial intelligence works, which I've already done. And then I'll explain to you the journeys that we've taken in the last, the, the journey I've taken in the last 16 years on digital development, how the role of digital technologies in uh, human emancipation, that's development, creating jobs and uh, reducing uh, poverty. It's a big problem in South Africa. And then I will conclude with three fundamental steps that we can take in order to take back control. So I've spent the last 16 years trying to understand the role of digital technologies in human emancipation. If you think about it in South Africa, each and every family has at least one youth who is unemployed, at least. I've been to homes where you find the grandmom with nine people in the family at home. Five kids, and the, and, and the two eldest have kids, all in the same house, all surviving on the old age grant. That's a very dangerous situation, and, and that's just the average. Of course, you know, there are worse situations. But here's the funny part. When those people get money, guess the first thing they buy? Data. And when they buy data, do you know what they use it for? to watch Kardashians. I mean, Kardashians are not even South African. And you, you ask yourself, there's something missing here. So as an academic, one of the first things that we have to have is to have a model through which we think about the world. So the model we have about development is taken from a leading uh, Nobel Prize winner in development economics. His name is Amartya Sen, an Indian. He's still alive, pretty old, but he's Ideas on development, human development, um, are what influenced the United Nations, the uh, SDGs, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the uh, Millennium Development Goals, and a lot of uh, global development today is influenced by his ideas. So his ideas suggest that uh, the
First thing they ask for is, I want my device, isn't it? Next thing they want is data. When I ask my son, I'm going to a certain place, the first question he asks me, do they have Wi-Fi? And then he makes a decision where he, whether he'll come. And then, interesting enough that today, food, shelter, and clothing are pretty much provided by government, so people don't think about them much. Uh, so those are being seen as, uh, as critical needs today. But development suggests that people need to have access to these resources. And then the second step is that we are generally an average of the people we spend time with. So we need to acquire skills in order to have the freedom to do something with our lives. Uh, so that is called uh, freedom to achieve, freedom to do something that you enjoy or that you can do, you can actually do. Um, and it's usually influenced by our peers, our family. So if you are coming from a certain area, you'll find most people who come from there are carpenters, for example. Okay? Then the third step, which is the most important, is our ideas of the good life. We all have different perceptions of what we think the good life is. For some people, depending on where you grew up, if I have a shiny shoe, that is I have arrived, you know? <laughs> Trust me, you, you'll be shocked. It may be so deep inside, embedded inside someone, but this transition from being skilled to enjoying the good life actually takes a lot of work. It's a lot of choice. There are decisions that have to be made on a daily basis. Most people fail to make that transition, mainly because they are afraid. It's, it's a lot of work. And we all know that if we fail to make a choice, we have implicitly made a choice. And therefore, this is what happens to most people. If they don't pursue the good life, Susie tells them the good life they should pursue. She tells them, oh, on Netflix, do you know what's happening? Do you know what's trending in South Africa? It is this, you should watch it. And the series keep coming out, you know. Sometimes I've binged on series during COVID a whole night and you wonder, what's wrong with me? You know, I'm supposed to be better. So this is, what, uh, this is how development works. So that's, the, that's the, the portal where we are storing all our data. For those who are interested, you can always go and look at it. We, we are visualizing the data across South Africa. Uh, it's not fully ready. So let me tell you about what we experienced, the journey we've been through. So the first place we looked at was policy implementation. In South Africa, we've got the best policies. But why is it that we struggle to implement the policies? So we tried to apply digital technology with Ubuntu to get people together. But within a short space of time, they got bored and they got their cell phones and they, did, they were not interested in the technology anymore. So we decided to empower entrepreneurs, small businesses. Within a very short time, we discovered that not everyone is designed to be an entrepreneur. Only one in a thousand can be an entrepreneur. You can be a small business owner, but being an entrepreneur, it takes guts, it takes tenacity, it takes no sleep, lot, lots of work. And then the third thing that we checked, we even tried to develop a software to understand uh, which was designed around the SMEs, uh, around the small businesses. Did they use it? No, they preferred the free things. So there's a kind of bewitching effect of these free softwares. One of my braver students studied his entire PhD on the role and the influence of spirituality on adopting digital technologies. I think that's pretty brave for, for a PhD. Guess what he found? People, we are actually bewitched. <laughs> Google my name, look for spirituality, you'll see the paper. It's amazing. But here's the, fact, here's the most intriguing part. We found that only one in six people on average around the world and in South Africa as well will actually go online and skill themselves up. But we, then we looked closer at the data, and it tells us that one in 13 people in the townships, because townships, I think, are the, the places which are the most at the margin. I mean, li life is pretty tough there. One in 13 people actually go online, study courses, they break the mold, they break through. So we began to try and understand those one in 1,000 who are entrepreneurs, those one in 13 people, what do they look like? And we kind of summed it up in three, three simple steps, but it comes up in one word. It's either a clamor for resources or being resourceful. 
So the one in a thousand are resourceful. The millions are always looking for more resources. So the resourceful people are always asking themselves, what can I do with what I have? And this is the fundamental difference that makes the one in 13, the one in a thousand different. And so there are three fundamental steps that we identified that we can use to take back control of Susie. The first one is to begin with what we want. It's as simple as that. It sounds easy, but doesn't come naturally. Usually we are clamoring to the demands of other people, to the things that relieve the pain of the failures, of the fears that we've got. But the first thing is to understand, what do I want? Very, very important. And it's very critical to say them out. Because it's something that the brain does, it picks it up immediately. There's some things that happen in the brain which pick up and it kind of gets wired into your body. But not only that, Susie hears. She hears everything that happens in your bedroom, you're snoring. She will also hear what you want. And she's beginning to program herself. The second step is to identify the why, the purpose. Why do we want this? Why do we want what we want? This is the most important in my opinion. For example, I want to have a lot of energy. Why? Because I want to spend time with the people I love and I want to whip my son at basketball. He is quick on his feet. I can only jump as high as I can think. That's not very far. So pretty much that's my motivation, but guess what it juices me? And the third and most important step, in my opinion, because this is what separates the boys from the men, the girls from the ladies, okay, something like that, is then to identify what resources do I have to execute and immediately execute. We have to take control back from Susie. In fact, we don't have to. We must take control back from Susie. And when we do, we can make this world a better place. We can make South Africa and Africa a much better place.